as my craft? Yes. No, that's as far away as, as you can get. No, it, the OTCX-1 belongs to everybody. It's a, the conception was put together by some very meaningful and caring people, and it was based on a very, very uh, caring and intelligent beings that wanted to see this happen. At the present time, well, me personally, uh, we, I have to say this collectively because we are working in many different areas and we have reached the, the stage of the prototype um, <clears throat> reality where we are now ready to produce when given the signal that they're <clears throat> ready to understand the technology in, in the reality that it exists. Yes, the answer is we do have things waiting in the wings for people. Well, the first part of the question, I don't recall uh, the statement being made from me that I had these in full operation or in operation at all. I did say that, you know, we, we, we were working on them and we do have uh, waiting in the wings things that uh, attribute to to uh, making a better life for everybody, and uh, they are uh, in essence free of moving parts, free of pollution, free of maintenance of any kind, and uh, we uh, have to now raise the consciousness. That means wake people up far enough to let go of the old ideas of, of uh, <clears throat> uh, aerodynamics and, and uh, combustion engines, etc., and just look into the reality of a, an easier, a simpler way that requires no fuel from Earth. The fuel comes out of the ethers known in our vernacular as magnetism mm -hmm. and it's everywhere in the multiverse never run out of fuel and no moving parts because in the 50s and 60s when we were designing and building them we we did realize to to understand vortex mechanics and quantum realities we had to counter rotate this is the way nature does everything she creates vortices everywhere and so we had moving parts. Since then, we've met engineers in the electronic field that, uh, that <clears throat> have proven to us that solid state trick circuitry is now alive and well, and moving parts are history. We no longer have to do them with moving parts. So uh, digital solid state circuitry is, is an advanced version of what we did back in the 50s and 60s. Well, now I'm, I'm just, you know, I, uh, my uh, status was a, a lab tech. I, I, I left where the previous job I had was a laboratory technician. And when, when I went to CAR, I thought that's where I fit in. But I became a gopher. I went for hamburgers and food and hot drinks for the guys. And I worked on the lathe because as a, as a kid I was a machinist, so I knew how to turn things. I knew how to use a a bench press, a, you know, a, a milling machine, etc. So I did cut uh, some of the parts. I helped uh, hold wires while they were connecting different things. I, I was kind of a, 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 a day Friday boy around there. So I had many, many jobs. I had, uh, I was multitasking all the time. So, but my job wasn't to design and my job wasn't to to build per se, I helped them build it, but I, I I was not the the engineer, and I didn't have the even though I understood sacred geometry and how exacting it has to be or it won't work. I and I honored that while I was working, and everything I did was with that in mind. But but uh, <clears throat> there was there was quite a few of us working on it, and so I was just a cog in the wheel.
Well, I want, I, I love the guy when I met him. He was just pure spirit. He just, his whole heart went out to humanity. He felt, he, when he looked at the earth, like, <clears throat> like I imagined, and what he conveyed to me from uh, the viewpoints of Tesla, that we were slowly digging ourselves into a, <clears throat> a continuous wheel that would just go around and round and not, not evolve. It would revolve and not evolve. Uh, because of the technology that was being used uh, based on a profit margin. Every, the parts, the pieces, the ideas were based, what is my return on my investment? What can I do? What, what can we do to, get, to make more money? And this was not Tesla's idea at all. When, they, when he was with Westinghouse and they designed the dynamos at, at, uh, at the Niagara Falls, he did that. He, he was offered fifty thousand dollars at one time, and he turned it down and said, "No, that's that's for our work." So, yeah, that's the kind of man Tesla and Carr were. They they put humanity first, and if the money comes, it'll come, and if it doesn't, we'll find a better way or another way. He did emphasize to all of us all the time, 24/7, the the uh, the um, the need for understanding what consciousness was, to being consciously aware of every move. If we moved apart from from point A to point B, we had to know exactly where we moved it from, and exactly where we put it. And the idea of that training was to realize that. <coughs> In sacred geometry, you have to have your alignments exact. If you don't put them in the right place at the right time, uh, you'll get no results. So by putting them and being conscious of where I put this or where I'm putting this uh, at all times, it, it falls into place and eventually whatever your, your cause is will have an effect that's, that's uh, successful. It was to create resident frequencies of a designated um, rendezvous or landing point downrange uh, that we were uh, going to uh, teleport to. Uh, teleporting is, is something that has to do with being outside of what we call time and space. It just is uh, a state of being, a state of the mind, and... Uh, when the uh, crystal resonated at the frequency equivalent to what was downrange, then we simply had the ability to move through time and space and rendezvous at that point and back again. The engineers, they, they uh, took a, a truck and went down and they had their instruments uh, and I don't know what they're called uh, but they equated the location to light and color or the location was vibrating at certain uh, uh, vibrations and frequencies equated to light and color so they said well this is it this, they scanned the area and uh, said this is this is where the, the craft will, will come and go from. Well, <laughs> the answer to that is there's nothing impossible and uh, that whatever is conceived by man can also be achieved by man. We weren't uh, able to fly at one time, we weren't able to go to the moon at one time and all these are history now. Like Spaceships will soon become. No, flying is a is a misnomer. You, you you really can't. Flying is is based on aerodynamics, and the craft itself didn't fly per se. It levitated, and once it reached a resonant frequency of where the intended destination was, it simply, uh, to our physical 
reality, our eyes would become invisible. It would, it would go down range and come back. And uh, I, I don't know if I should go any deeper into it than that. If you, if you like, I will. But. We were dealing with, and Carr kept, kept, um, kept us well aware of, of consciousness and what, who and what we are. Basically, we are energy. We are, we are force fields. All of us are light beings. <clears throat> we lost the awareness of this because we chose to <clears throat> use our, <clears throat> our powers of creation to create a third dimensional reality and, um, uh, and, and move through time and space in, in uh, segments. Uh, actually, energy cannot be created or destroyed and energy is everywhere and we are a part of a one collective consciousness that's also everywhere so in essence uh, we moved downrange at the speed of thought we had only to think of where we were going and we were, we were already there because energy is everywhere Well, I saw a lot of different plans, and we had we had scores of plans that weren't. In the, they, we were obsoleting a lot of the plans because some of the things we were working with uh, didn't come up to speed, didn't come up to the qualifications we required. So there were there was plans. Uh, I might say st neatly stuck away, but they were on the on the benches, and they were in the offices. So there was a lot of plans around. Well, a day at, at OTC Enterprises was a 24-hour day. If someone was on on the benches or on the presses or on on the designing tables or uh, you know using what we had to to put things together. So, and I remember <coughs> you know being at three o'clock in the morning, being there <coughs> when there was almost the whole crew working. <clears throat> Excuse me, but it it wasn't a typical nine to five operation. Everyone loved what they were doing, and that made the big difference. Uh, when I <clears throat> excuse me, when I chose to go down and take a rest, I couldn't rest very long because I wanted to get back to what I was doing. That's that's how strong the the love of the work was. We wanted to see it work, and and the other people, the other engineers, and. And the PR people and stuff were the same way. They, they get an hour or two rest, or maybe not even that, and they'd want to get back to work. It was a wonderful feeling. I mean, we loved what we were doing, and every time we made a step, we'd all congregate around, and and Carr would make us understand how that step came about and what it was, and and how uh, important it was to stay in alignment with natural law, the keeping resonant frequencies with with the flow of energy as it flows. Yes, indeed. And they're, they're very uh, as anxious now, which does my heart a very, very good feeling uh, because they're as anxious today as we were in those days. They, they see, they understand sacred geometry. The codes that Carr put into the dimensions of mystery uh, a, a book that he wrote on poetry and prose and so forth, when he was turned down by the patent office to uh, patent a device with, with levitation, uh, he had to pull that out and, and he wrote a book and said, when the day comes that they'll be able to decode this, we'll have spaceships again, because this is the sole story and simplicity of, of levitation and how, how simple it is. Well, uh, yes, there there were remnants, and I've I've carried them for years. Some of the remnants of the of some of the the sketches and some of the specs and and uh, a few of the prints, but for the most part, uh, realizing that the system was not ready for what we had to offer, we knew that that we might be shut down, and we tried to protect what we had, but 
uh, the shutdown came faster than we realized. We never thought that would happen so abruptly. And uh, all everything was confiscated. Everything was taken out of the, the offices, all the files, all the prints in the shop, you know, all taken. He knew, and, and, and we also knew that we were very close to the edge of being shut down because uh, as Tesla was, was encouraged to stop because he was threatening the monetary system, we realized we were a great threat to the monetary system because what we had to offer required, uh, once built, the, the uh, spaceships, or the devices from the utron that could be put in people's homes to to accumulate and use electricity, there'd be no more need for the grid system and the meters and so forth. So it's a great threat, and to the automobile industry and the the petroleum industry, it was. And so we knew, and Carr told us, we don't know if we can get this going before we're shut down. So it was always a a knowing that we had to face. But he also said. It's inevitable. It has to happen someday. And maybe we're just the middle man, or maybe we're the second or third or fourth, but they, someday it will happen because it has to, because they'll paint themselves into a corner and don't know how, won't know how to get out unless they go to the visionaries, go to the inventors, go to the discoverers, people, the garage mechanics that are putting these things together and, and, and humbly seek their, their knowledge and wisdom because that's where all good things happen, is in the imagination of the little guys. Well, um, I was told here, uh, we're in Prescott, Arizona right now, and, and just uh, a mile or two away from here is Yavapai College. And uh, I built a, a replica of the spaceships. I came out here to build a replica, replica of the spaceship underground. And uh, I uh, designed and built it the same way we built the craft, being very careful to follow natural law. And they, uh, people that got wind of it came and were very impressed. And uh, they had uh, people coming out filming it and so forth. And they asked me to speak at Yavapai College and how I could build a magnificent habitat that was running totally on free and abundant energy for $5,000 that was uh, praised and valued in those days at $165,000. So they asked me to speak and I did. And that a very grainy video still exists. It's somewhere on the, in the archives of, of the whole episode and, and the house. But while I was at Zavapai College, a <coughs> professor had, this was when the Freedom of Information Act uh, was in progress, and he gave a lecture there, and I happened to be in the in the lecture hall when he was going on about all these things that are happening that we knew nothing about. Now they're known as black ops, but in those days we didn't really have a label for a lot of them. We just felt that they were using taxpayers' monies and not letting the people know where the money was going and so forth. And he said one of the things that he that um, he noticed, and he didn't even know. I was in the audience, but he was mentioning that he was in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and and uh, he'd gone down nine levels underground, nine elevators or whatever down underground, and noticed that these there were bays filled with different, very unusually built devices uh, that 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 looked like it was from out of the future, and one of them that he saw was the OTCX1 the 45-foot craft that was confiscated. And uh, the uh, orders of the guides or the guardians of the place were ordered not to talk to any of the, the observers, but he happened to make friends with, with one of the, the guardians and our guards. And he said that they had tried to mount weapons on them. And using a pure magnetic field, weapons are obsolete. They can't be used. So what happened, there was a lot of very uh, tragic and severe accidents because everything they tried would blow up on them. And uh, they had to abandon the idea. They were going to use them as scout vehicles and so forth. So, 
so I was I was happy to know that that uh, of the location, and I was happy to know that you know uh, that they they weren't going to be able to use it because those those machines, the ones we were building, was for humanity, and you had to have the spirit of love and respect, or they wouldn't operate. I had just got done uh, with, a, I'd spent some time at the UC Davis, the Uni University of California at Davis, with a professor, Moeller, who was designing and building on government grants vehicles that were supposed to be levitational uh, eventually, uh, and they were shaped like a circular foil craft, but they had eight um, small combustion engines around the periphery, and they'd fire them up, and they'd, it would levitate, and the noise was so bad I couldn't even stand it. I couldn't be in the... But I, I had talked to, to Moeller and said, you know, that uh, what about if we considered another source for the power, like magnetism? And uh, he rather abruptly told me, no, no, this is government funded. This is what they want me to do. This is kind of a showtime for the public to see. See, we're working on this. Then I said, well, you, you expect to ever succeed? He says, not at this rate. We're never going to get more than 100 feet off the ground. So I said, well, uh, okay, thank you. And now he's building floating cars or uh, get off maybe 10 or 15 feet off the ground. But the amount of money he was being paid on government grants to just make a show that they, well, we're working on it, uh, was was tremendous. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars for, for not, it wasn't going productively anywhere. Yeah, well, let's, this was the intent. Um, I wanted to get, become isolated far enough away from the, from the mainstream so that uh, uh, I wouldn't be bothered or looky lose and so forth, because some of the things that we were experimenting with, experimenting with, did have things to do with light and vibrations and some sounds and so forth. So uh, we felt our way uh, <clears throat> over to Prescott, Arizona, and uh, actually about. 18 miles north of Prescott is a place called Chino Valley, and we found a very remote piece of land. And we had to have the land invite us because it's part of sacred geometry. You have to be at the right place. You have to start it with a solid foundation or it won't work. The land invited us through a whole series of very beautiful coincidences. We got the land, <clears throat> and uh, the idea was to build an underground house and uh, from the levitation point, if we could. But the minute we even thought about levitation, the planning and zoning said, there's no such thing. Don't You're going to have to anchor this and so forth. So we didn't go any further with that idea. We said, OK. So we did build the craft, the, the replica. It's still there to this day. We were over there just the other, the other day. I think you were with us. Uh, it's still intact, it's still uh, uh, functional. Uh, it's been remodeled, but the, uh, the, uh, we started, once we got it built to a point where I, I could put up a workbench, I started building small uh, experimental models that I wanted to, to we, were, we, had a, we had 12 acres, 12 and a half acres, and I had a, a meadow down below, and I wanted to <coughs> levitate these craft around so that, um, just for test to see if we could do it. Well, I didn't have enough of the knowledge. I didn't have enough of what I was doing. So it was taking me quite a bit of time. But we attracted from the neighbors, you know, of our activity, because we were lighting up the whole place and we had no, no wires, no, no telephone poles. We had plenty of water. We were using air wells for water. We were using 
um, um, ham radios for, for telephones and uh, solar panels and we had uh, we had television, we had computer, small computer, Timex Sinclair, 16 KBs, but that's what it was in those days. But everything was running and we lit up the, the whole top of the mountain and our neighbors were using candle lights and and <coughs> and you know lanterns and flashlights and so they, they we became a very curious thing to them so <coughs> they had people coming out you know they would report them to somebody and they would come out and and kind of see what are you up to here and so forth and are you following the codes and the rules and because our, our septic system that we put in I didn't want to go with that I had got plans from Sweden of a recyclable system that was com completely pure and reusable, the methane gas and everything could be used. And I went to the planning and zoning and they said, forget it, you've got to dig a whole septic system, put a leach line. I had to, I had to adhere to something I didn't want to. But we became apprehensive because they were uh, then starting to fly See, I was being watched ever since I left the car. They said, we're going to be monitoring you forever and you're not to get ever try this again or get together with anybody and so forth. So then when we started noticing these black helicopters with no markings on them and they'd come right over with big cameras and I could see the, the guy with the, you know, with the cameras just filming our land and filming, trying to film what was inside the underground house we felt this isn't going to work because they're going to, you know, they're going to come in and and uh, take our land away or whatever. So um, we put it into prayer, if you will, and uh, just you know turned it over to to natural law that what what the next step would be would come to us. We didn't even try to plan anything, and. Uh, uh, a gentleman by the name of Walter Baumgartner, who wrote the magazines uh, um, Energy, oh, what is the name of that? Um, Energy Unlimited, I believe is the name of the magazine. He wrote volumes after volumes of, of <clears throat> the type of work we were doing, and he even had Tesla's work in there. But he came over and said, I'd heard about you, and I don't really know how he heard about us, because we were trying to keep things kind of quiet. And I said, well, we're having difficulty here because, you know, we're, we've been kind of spotted, and we've been told, you know, if we, you know, and he says, well, don't worry about that. I've got a place in Magdalena, New Mexico, totally, it's on an Indian reservation, totally isolated, and I've got all the facilities, the machine shop, and tool and dry it to help you. Will you work with me? And I said, sure. So we gave him everything we had so that if anybody came in of, of any ideas of, you know, finding something that they could, you know, uh, cause a, a problem for us, uh, we, got, we gave it to, to Walter. He took him back over to New Mexico, and then and very delightfully, we were then commuting back and forth to New Mexico, and he was building uh, small replicas and larger replicas over there. I do still have some of those plans and things somewhere. But he got so far, and uh, the unusual thing that most people don't understand, this isn't a conventional nuts and bolts linear craft. It's not like anything not like an automobile you can't <coughs> put in a key turn it on and run it like an automobile it's run by consciousness it's run by uh, synergizing with the with the craft itself and when you're working with it you have to be very very humble and close to nature because every detail has to be honored for what it is and he built it and he he was he, he was successful in levitating it off his platform in inches, and it took him a tremendous amount of work to get it that far. And he became very, very frustrated and kept coming back and forth, and we kept going over, and I said, you really have to have the spirit. You really have to love this. This is, has to be 
alive. Everything, when you understand it, is energy. But energy is live. It's 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 all alive consciousness. And in order to effectively get off the ground with this type of a device, you have to get very, very close to the consciousness of what you're working with. You have to love every part and love the way it sets and feel how it sets. And if it doesn't feel right, tear it up and start over. Because it won't work unless you feel your way through it. You think your way through it, you'll never get anywhere. Because the thought is very limited. It just doesn't... doesn't... Uh, care much about anything outside of its jurisdiction, which is a third dimensional reali reality, third dimensional body. Anything foreign to that is a threat. So it, it ignores or sets up a defense or even becomes very aggressive to anything outside of its jurisdiction. So, and he, he had those blocks that he couldn't get out of the way and allow his spirit, the spirit of loving what he was doing, even though he was an engineer and he, even though he he enjoyed the, the challenge. Uh, he eventually, uh, we, we, we lost contact because I, we had to get, we had to do some other things. And uh, eventually uh, uh, he had to uh, cease his operation. And I don't know, I never talked to him in the final days or whatever, so and I heard he's gone to Canada. He went to Canada and was uh, trying to affect building them in Canada with somebody. But that's the last I'd ever heard of him. Oh well that that was that was abandoned at one time. I mean, we were, you know, the, a lot of these, I don't know, some of them anyway are, are are earlier drawings and and some of the later drawings aren't even here, but uh the accumulator once aligned with the uh, with the natural flows of energy, the magnetic fields of energy that are flowing all around us uh accumulated electricity, if you will, or energy, not really uh, electricity till it, it accumulated it and then distributed it, uh, opposed to a generator which generates electricity. And this is what we live in now, generated electricity which is sold through telephone poles and, and wires and eventually a meter and, and become very, very expensive, causing um, a displacement of sometimes 78 to 80 percent of a person's income just to support the energy bills. So we wanted to replace them with this simple utron, which is an accumulator. And once, once put in the craft, this is a this is a, an RV in the sky. You can take off and and uh, you can stay a few inches or a few miles above the surface. You can never have an accident because in magnetic fields you're, you're accident free. There's no noise, there's no pollution, there's no G-forces to experience. It's a different, it's a different uh, mousetrap. It's completely different. Yeah, aerials are essential. And when, when, when we were experimenting, we had, to have, we had to have the grounding, which was the earth, and we had to have an antenna, an aerial, which is the you could say the positive and negative uh, understanding of how energy flows. Like the Mobius twist, everything is in vortexial motion. It never really begins or ends. And in order to tap it at, the, at a point where it's going to be beneficial, you have to, to have an, an antenna and you have to have a grounding at, at per se in our experiments. And later on, we found we didn't need that because there was other ways of attaining a ground. We used the magnetic fields around the earth and and we uh, you might say tweaked it so that we had a grounding and we didn't wasn't necessary to ground ourselves there is no threat to the system as far as people wanting the horse and buggy the Amish still have the horse and buggy the Quakers have the horse and buggy 
the uh, car lovers, enthusiasts, classic cars, there's still Corvettes, there's still Maseratis, there's Lambinis, they don't have to give any of that up. We just want to add to the system. We want to, like they added airplanes, now we want to add um, a, a, a vehicle, a, a, a ship, if you will, a circular foil craft that would be both habitation and transportation. And they could be as large as you wanted. You could have farms, you could have waterfalls, you could have lakes, you could have anything on them. It, it doesn't matter. It, 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 the te technology that I'm speaking of doesn't sound very familiar because it's, it's ether in essence and it has to do with the creative powers of the mind and once you realize how creative we really are you can do anything there are there is nothing that's impossible to do and we've done it we've been there and done it and now we want to present this over and over again until they allow us the, the privilege of showing them what we got Well, we 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 experimented with both, and it took it took Carr years to to finally, you know, in many many experiments, lots of time, lots of money, to uh, finally arrive at a very hollow double tetrahedron, just like shaped like a diamond, and, or two ice cream cones, one on top of the other at the at the base, and uh, this being uh, because it contained all the geometric configurations of the platonic solids, which, you know, there's a square, there's a circle, et cetera, et cetera, the pyramid, all in one, in one object, which has now been being called the accumulator. And once you take that and you understand through sacred geometry the rivers of space, the magnetic fields, everything has the magnetic fields around it, through it, and in it. And once you understand that, then you can accumulate energy and uh, no batteries necessary. The accumulation and distribution is all one and it goes on forever. There's no need for batteries, etc. Because you're, you're actually piggybacking, <laughs> piggybacking, piggybacking nature uh, energy itself. There's nothing but energy and you're piggybacking that and using it as such. You're grabbing on and it would be like um, grabbing onto a streetcar and going where your destination might be a mile away and then letting go. It's the same thing with energy. It's everywhere so you have only to grab onto it to use it and uh, it's inexhaustible. It goes on forever. I really, I really don't know because the materials in those days are very antiquated compared to what we have today. Mm -hmm. And to say silicone or, or poly anything would be a mistake because I don't know what it was. I'm not sure. Yeah, right. Yeah, and they he, he, that and those. I don't know where they're at now in aluminum, but that in those days that was the best you could get, and that's what we wanted. Um, the other parts of the craft, some of them were conventional parts. Uh, you know, I I machined some of the little parts and stuff, but I I don't really remember too much about the details of everything. Yeah, true. Now that they uh, the outer ones differ in in the, in the, in the uh, sense that they were solid, but they were suspended on both tips, like the diamond, the double tetrahedron, mm -hmm. so that they could turn. So if if the natural flows of energy caused them to turn, so what? Or if we didn't care, and it may could have been used to its advantage if we understood it, but. It wasn't necessary. So we just had them suspended through, and they were going through uh, you know, horseshoe magnets. The answer to that 
has to be multi because it, it, it's, it's not a single answer. Like a generator is a motor and a motor is a generator. Just depending on how you're using it or your windings or your, or your, uh, your, your understanding of what a generator does and what a motor does and so forth. So the accumulator was capable of doing many, many things. You know, it wasn't just to operate a spaceship per se. In fact, the initial idea was to, to make up small um, uh, uh, prototypes, boxes, if you will, call them black boxes, uh, that you could, uh, with an antenna on it, and give, give everyone a box for their home eventually, that, that they could, um, they'd have to be able to take the responsibility of dealing with the power companies or whatever, but we wanted to at least, as far as our finances would go, give them out to as many people as we could to have them be our, our advertising and our PR work so that uh, they say, yes, I've had these things and it's been working fine and so forth, but we never got that far. But the question is that the, uh, uh, the answer to the question the accumulator was not built just for the spaceship. It was built to to for to to tie in with the laws of nature to the oneness of it all. That's that's the oneness is the inexhaustible energy that's always flowing, and uh, that could be used anywhere. You can put it if you had a small accumulator that was in in, in perfect alignment. Uh, you could put it on anything, any conventional thing. Now it could could um, properly adapted could be the plug could be pulled from the wall and you could operate it with these small accumulators yeah the spindle I'm not I, I don't you know I uh, I I don't recall the, the spindle it must have I don't recall a spindle ever going through the accumulator but it but uh, apparently, maybe it did. I never saw the inside of it. I knew that it was hollow. There was nothing in there. And I would think that any in insertion of anything in there would, would disrupt the, the, uh, the uh, sacred geometry, unless it was designed to work that way. But I, I, I don't know. The most effective way that can be helping in this entire agenda of this entire intention is to be who and what they really are to not not hold anything in pretension anymore not not to have to say yes to something they mean no to or no to something they mean yes to 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 align their heart with their mouth with their brain and say what they really feel and do what they really feel this will affect the change necessary, not only in them, but in the collective consciousness, which is all of us. And if we all do this collectively together, if we can get the idea of standing our ground and with the threat of being fired, with the threat of losing your home or car, stand your ground because you have the power of the multiverse with you. You, you don't have the threats and worries and fears and doubts of the third dimension any longer if you don't want it. We bring these things on because we've given our power away because of fear and doubts. And we now have to take our power back, realizing simply, I'm me. I can't help it. I love it. And just love yourself. Love what you're doing. And brace yourself because there are tests. <laughs> the tests that you're giving yourself. Nobody out there is giving them to you but yourself. But there are tests that you have to go through. It's in some cases called the ring ring pass knot there are in, in buddhist there's many many initiations that you have to go through in life before you can achieve a state of knowing of being still and peaceful inside and then along comes the joy and then eventually you'll find bliss and realizing everywhere you go is heaven everywhere everything you do if you want Something to change, you can have a contrast because you can create it. If you want disturbance, you can create it. But you're, it's in control of you, nobody else. 
So the best thing in the way of helping would be to raise the consciousness. Of course, we have people in the field now spending long hours, day and night, like Walter, who's, who's filming this episode right now. He's coming here with, with, with just his honor, his dedication, his devotion to seeing that these words and, and ideas are getting out to the people. No pay, no, no, nobody really sponsoring or taking care of his needs and so forth. And there, and there are people in our pods. We call them pods. They're just small groups of people. In, uh, they're all over the world, in Australia and New Zealand and, and uh, everywhere, uh, are working on a shoestring. So if uh, you happen to be, have money that you really don't know what to do with and you'd like to make a better world of it, that's up to you. But we'd, we're not asking for it, but I'm covering all bases in the answer to the question. But whatever you feel is your motivation or your dedication to what we're trying to do will be welcomed and used effectively to affect the change. First of all, there are now, there are, there are three well-known uh, stages of knighthood. Uh, one is the Knights of Malta, one is the Knights of St. John, which are affiliated with the Knights of Malta. And then there's the Knights Templar. That's the three well-known knights. There are knights everywhere in the world on different levels, and, and uh, some of them are rogue knights. They just go around affecting changes and helping people, not asking for anything in return. And those are the, That's what true knighthood is. It doesn't want to do anything but protect the rights of others to pursue whatever life they want. The uh, changes now in knighthood are being um, observed uh, on, the, um, on, a, on a very large and deeply rooted scale, that being they were and still are to this day an organization. They are a corporate organization that has rules and regulations based on third dimensional realities with contracts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in a sense. It's not as drastic as the contracts we have with General Motors or, or PG&E or whatever, but it is still um, a, a monarchy where they're being told you must adhere to this and that, like a religion. It's, it's similar to a religion, although it's much deeper, because a knight is, is dedicated, and you, you have to be dedicated. You're a knight before you're a knight. You have, to, you have to have it in your heart and soul to want to be a guardian of people's rights to pursue the life the way they want, in any way they want, no restrictions, no nothing. And the organizations have restrictions. You, well, you really have to do this and wear this and so forth. So now they're they're dissolving the organizations. And many of us, uh, Marsha and I, were both knights in the Knights Templar. We've pulled away from the structure, and have become what's known as rogue knights. We still now are free to be silent knights. We can go out and effect changes just what we're doing. Quietly we go at, at no no charge. We we put on lectures all over the place at our own expense and so forth because we enjoy doing it. And that joy brings us great satisfaction in 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 the people realizing what we're talking about and waking up and and letting us know, wow, I never knew that. And things like that. That's where we get our energy. So um the Knights of Malta, we have, <clears throat> we have friends that are Knights of, of Malta, and the Knights of St. John, are, and the Knights, uh, there's the Knights Hospitallers. We have one of our pods is, uh, <clears throat> is located in, in uh, Australia. It's called uh, Path of Divine Restoration, and it's, it's, it's run by Knights that are rogue Knights. And we are, 
we are doing and being effective in changing the realities of what's been going on in the way of tyranny, in the way of of uh, of servitude and so forth. They are <clears throat> they are very actively alive, and they have pulled away from structure. So they're all now rogue knights. There there are knights in in Canada. Same thing. They are becoming rogue knights, pulling away from the structure, which frees us to be who and what we are, to be on our own free will, to be responsible for our own action. We don't have to adhere to anybody except our source, which is God. And when we're in touch with that source, we're being led to where we can help and affect a positive or a, a constructive change in reality. And so it on it goes, the structures now uh, all corporate structures now are feeling the effects of what's happening. Everything is in a, a flux, a change. And they are disintegrating because they were built on <clears throat> grains of sand instead of a solid foundation. The first, um, the first thing, the first choice, the first, first decision that have decisions that have been made we're based on a profit margin instead of on the idea of of making a better life for everybody, regardless of the money. And when you base things on a profit margin, you become very, very sloppy and very you don't particularly care where or how you can you can fluctuate the the uh, monetary system up or down according to what the traffic will bear. And uh, this puts people at a in a very awkward situation. But those that were built on the premise of, of a profit return are now starting to crumble and they will all fall apart. They can't hold up. Those that have been based on a humanitarian interest, both human, both uh, animal and, and plant life and, and caring for those things, will flourish and become now the the uh, new and different paradigm that will return this earth to what it was always meant to be, a beautiful garden. And we can visit it off the ground once in a while, you know. So I, I don't know, that's the nights. Um, we're, um, we're honored, very humbly honored to be nights. And uh, it, it isn't something that happens overnight. It takes a lot of... Um, of, uh, of um, dedication, a lot of knowing that that uh, everyone's life must become more important than your own at all times. So no matter where you go or what you do, that's where we stand. It would be appropriate to say that these things and more are now waiting in pods around the earth. It's global in scope, and uh, people have only to raise their scopes, their horizons, or their consciousness to start accepting things <clears throat> that um, they have been programmed not to accept in the past. As a sense of reprogramming, saying, and doing and realizing everything is a part of the one and the one is good. There is nothing that, that is not good. We have created the idea of evil. We, as humans, have created the idea of fear and doubts. And this is our creation. It is not nature. And if we refuse to no longer use those, our consciousness will raise all and of itself to a higher degree, a higher understanding, and a deeper love and respect for nature and all the laws that go with it. It has only to um, be realized that we are energy. We are materializing things with our mind. This, this um, density called the third dimension <coughs> is being created in what could equate to nanoseconds. It's so fast that the, the, the brain cannot even conceive of the, the conception of, of manifestation. 
But the minute we look at something, we're creating it. The minute we think of something, we're creating it. We are infinite creators, and we go on and on forever. And if we would create good and wonderful things, be productive in what we think about, what we feel, what we know, what, and look at things with compassion and love instead of fears and doubts and, and ideas of profit margins, we could have the realization that we have never left heaven, that it's always been here. We just lost sight of it. And in raising our consciousness, you'll find joy in what you're doing, joy in what, <clears throat> what you realize, and eventually feel everywhere you go is heaven because it's not outside yourself, it's inside. And once you find that, you, you never want to go anyplace else. So uh, they, I guess that would... Uh, would uh, I would like to see everybody ponder that for a while and realize I, I had my parts of my a part of my body my finger looked at under an electron microscope and all I saw was energy. That convinced me that what what I now know to be true. But that was the reality that I was looking at pure energy. There's no finger. There was nothing there but energy. So when you get to realizing your energy and that you're a magnificent creative being and you don't have to succumb to servitude. You don't have to toil anymore under somebody's dictatorship for, for uh, the ways and means to take care of yourself and your family. You can stand your ground and realize that you are a part of an infinite creation and a creator which is all of us and collectively together there is nothing that can stop us. The thing that has separated us and continues to separate us is the programming that says we're wrong, we're bad, we're, we can't, we should, we shouldn't. And those things now, because we're entering a new paradigm, have to be abandoned. And the new ideas, simple ones, is I can do anything. Everything is good, everything is beautiful and I won't accept anything else. Once you accept or adopt that attitude, you'll find your whole world changing dramatically, beautifully, differently. And you don't have to worry because your needs will come to you. Don't try, just stay out of the way and keep that consciousness alive that everything is good, everything is, is, is okay. We're living in the now. The mistakes that the third dimension makes is taking the past and trying to put it into the future. A brief example of that is you have a problem that's coming up and it looks like the same problem we had before. So I'll use the same technique of the past. Well, the problem still comes back, so apparently it was never solved. So it keeps coming back stronger sometimes because that's the way nature kind of gives wake-up calls. Because you're taking the past understanding and trying to solve a future uh, situation and it will never work. You'll just be in a squirrel cage forever. You have to be still and live in the now and stay in the now with the faith and the trust and the, and the, the discipline because it's not easy. You want to you give in to temptation and you want to give in to the idea of panic and so forth and fears and doubts. But don't go there. Just stay your ground and stay there long enough and you'll find you will never be let down by the laws of nature because it's always with you. And if you keep taking the trash out of your thought patterns, uh, thought versus your feelings versus your intuition, if you keep taking those out and replacing them with your feelings of, of love and compassion and so forth, you'll find your, your, whole, uh, your whole world instantly sometimes will change and everything you need will come to you when you need it not necessarily when you want it but it will it will be there when you need it when something is really a part of necessary for your growth and understanding it will be there and it can't fail because you are the creator of your own reality your own destiny and you can create the need for something to take care of yourself your family or whatever and it will come in a different way, but it will come.